All right. Well, thank you all very much for having me out again. Uh, it's nice to, to speak to this group and, and follow up uh, with a little more information as we build on our practice and uh, keep rehabilitating more and more landscapes. So our focus is uh, creating landscapes for life. The primary focus being clean water, healthy soil that's sequestering carbon. We also wanna make sure that there's food security both for people and wildlife. My name again is Shannon Brown. I'm the founder of Ecosystem Regeneration Artisans. There's our email address. Uh, the name is a bit of a mouthful. So ERA, ERA Landscapes is the short form. We have the Facebook page that records a profile or portfolio of pretty uh, most of the projects we do. I fell behind on that a little bit this spring because we we're incredibly busy. We also have our website, eranativeland.com and an Instagram with some uh, very pretty pictures of what we do. So the principle that we're working with, our primary specialty is creating what are called rainscapes. This is a fairly new concept, even for people that are within the industry. So think of a zero escape, but rather than just conserving water, we go two steps better to actually harvesting the water that comes from the sky for free, sinking it into the ground, recharging our aquifer, recharging our groundwater supply. And I like to refer to that as our water bank account. Uh, the more water we go in, the more gets to come out later as a trickle over time. So moving into what is a rainscape? Why is it important? Um, so these systems are basically basins dug into the ground on contour so that they catch the rain and slowly sink it into the soil over time. So if you imagine a bowl dug into the ground, or a temporary pond, that's what this is. It's not going to have the water sit there for a long period of time. There's no mosquitoes being bred. The water sits in that bowl when it rains. Within 48 hours, it's disappeared in the soil. And for most people in the hill country, uh, it's usually uh, under eight hours before the water is sunk through the soil profile and into the ground. Um, it's not gone, it's just in the soil, and that helps nurture the trees and all of the plants around us, and it moves as what's called subsurface flow to the local rivers and creek very slowly. So what this does is when we catch that water in these basins, we're filtering the runoff pollution out. Any sort of uh, insecticides, pesticides, fertilizers, manure that's in the soil or in the water as it moves quickly across the land, when it catches in these basins, uh, it gets filtered out through the soil. Uh, as I mentioned previously, this also recharges our local groundwater supply. It conserves water because we're not having to irrigate nearly as much. And after about a year, we don't have to irrigate these systems at all. The water quality is improved because the uh, runoff pollution is filtered out and the soil helps to filter the water. And the better microbiology there is in that soil, the better filter it functions as. We also protect our, whoops, protect our rivers and streams because they're not getting hit with that flash flood water. They're not having that runoff pollution move into them and they're not getting massive amounts of erosion along their banks. Uh, also, we're, this goes hand in hand with protecting our rivers and streams, we're reducing the potential for flooding. Uh, when water moves quickly across the surface of the land, it gains velocity, carries sediment, and that's one of the nightmare situations for flooding. Uh, <clears throat> we're also building habitat for wildlife, and these landscapes are by their very nature drought hardy because they've harvested as much water as they can when the rain falls. And compared to a lawn, they're very low maintenance. Uh, there's a 20 year old system that I uh, got started in in Houston when I was about eight years old. And in terms of maintenance on that system, it's every six months or so, a team of volunteers goes through, clears excess plants, transplants them to other schools. And that's what maintenance they do rather than mowing every week to two weeks. And then it can enhance the curb appeal as well. So rather than having a boring lifeless uh, lawn that's not really doing anything for wildlife, uh, doesn't have any color, and it looks pretty static, 
the same year round, except turning gray in the winter, green in the summer. Um, <clears throat> these landscapes are dynamic. They have a lot of life and different, uh, it's like a temporal mosaic is the way I like to say it. Um, you see different things blooming at different times of year. You've got the wildflower season in the spring and the native grass colors in the fall. So everyone lives in a watershed. That's kind of the foundation of this is we're taking care of our own local watershed. These are our addresses within the water infrastructure of the world. Uh, <clears throat> if you think about, okay, well, you live in a city, that's the broad watershed. And then you can start to narrow that, that down into which neighborhood, which street. And we have, you know, you're in this river basin, you're in this creek shed, oh, and then this reach of that creek. So it all breaks down that way. As a specific example, this is a watershed in Austin. One of our client's houses is this black box here. You can see all of the houses, all of the streets running here, 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 and then through the center, we have a used to be creek. Uh, it is currently a concrete drainage ditch because all of the impervious cover of these homes damaged that watershed and created a situation where too much water was flowing through this creek as one, at once. And that was creating nightmarish erosion scenario, scenarios. So engineers came through and said, well, to protect the people that live near this, we need to concrete the edges of this. And so that's what happened. Uh, and that's based on the development practices in this area. And the creek, well, ditch uh, runs muddy, uh, doesn't hold water particularly well because concrete doesn't allow it to sink into the ground. So looking at specifically this one home, which is just one raindrop uh, that falls into a bucket, um, we can say, yeah, okay, well, let's look at this watershed, the micro watersheds of this home. Again, here's that same box of the property. And all of the water that falls in this brown section flows to this blue line and runs down and eventually hits the street and then it goes into a storm drain and out into that ditch. All of the water that falls on this purple section runs down this blue line and then out into the creek or into the storm drain, out into the street to the storm drain, and then to the creek slash ditch uh, with nothing filtering. So it's an incredible waste. Once the water hits the street, it starts to become polluted. That's no good for anyone. So our strategy is, okay, well, how do we catch that? We can catch it up here here, we can catch this one here. And with our current design program, we're actually able to break down, trace this brown area, trace this purple area, and say, well, how many square feet is that? And then from there, calculate the amount of water coming into the basins that are catching that water. So it's rainscaping with a lot of background information on what the current pre-existing watershed conditions are. So we're looking at water flowing like that, and then we try and catch it right in here. When we do this, it makes the earth smile. Here's a regenerative farm that uses this technique. It has this long conservation terrace. Uh, there's a long history of this through the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, back in the uh, Depression era. Um, you can sometimes see these uh, especially out in Fredericksburg, you'll see these um, bumps across the land with the ditch behind them to catch the water and slow it down so it's not just running straight off the hillside. And plants do incredibly well in this system because rather than all of that water that you see here just going downhill and away, it stays here in the land, in the soil and sinks in. So imagine if every lot was sinking its water in rather than letting it run off into this ditch. And in terms of what that looks like on a yard by yard scale, this is an example. So here we have a yard where we've just dug out the basins. And this on the left is an example of what that looks like when it's fully planted and has rocks along the bottom as an accent. So to really understand this concept, we follow the journey of a raindrop. And if you're a raindrop and you fall on a roof, you're probably going to go down, slide off the roof and hit the lawn. Uh, unless, of course, you go into a gutter and then you're redirected, collected with all the other raindrops. 
you go down that downspout and then out into Lavon, all collected together. And this is often an instance where we see a significant amount of erosion. So oftentimes this water from the gutter downspout goes across the lawn and straight into the street. But if we install a rain garden between the downspout or between just the roof, even if it doesn't have gutters and the street, we can start sinking that water into the ground. So it flows instead into this basin. This part here is the basin. And then on the downhill side, we have a berm, a little raised section. That water fills in this low area and that helps nurture an abundance of native plants. And one of the great things about vegetating the basin is that the plants thrive and also their deep roots are gonna help guide that water deeper into the soil profile than it would if it was just a uh, you know, traditional lawn. We'll get to a little more depth on that later. So flowing down across the lawn, down into the rain, uh, the rain garden basin. So what we're trying to do is mimic a natural system. In nature, most of the time, you get at least half of the water sinking into the ground with just about 10% runoff and some of it evapotranspirating out of the trees. But when we start to develop, you know, we come out, we use some heavy equipment to help build the house, we compact that soil a bit. Well, not as much water sinks into the ground and more starts to run off. And then, you know, we get a subdivision. Well, we've got even more runoff happening, less and less getting deeply infiltrated into the soil. And then, you know, we get to downtown Austin, downtown San Antonio, pretty much everything is paved over. There's very few places for the water to actually infiltrate into the soil profile at all. So we're looking at 15% you know, of water sinking into the ground as opposed to 50% of water sinking into the ground. So instead, 55% running off, going into the, you know, flushing out into the creek, creating the flash flooding. And that's part of why the San Antonio River looks like it does. So development practices have an impervious cover associated with those have a lot to do with flooding and water quality. So uh, Karen alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, there's two statistics that are really key to understanding this. So for every thousand square feet of roof or road, roughly 600 gallons of rainwater runoff per one inch of rain. So if you think about, okay, a 2000 square foot home, that's fairly standard. That means that in one inch of rain, that's 1200 gallons running off. In two inches of rain, that's 2400 gallons running off. And then if you build a thousand home subdivision, we're very quickly at millions of gallons of water running off in just a standard you know, one to two inch rain event. And the other important piece here is that for every 1% increase in soil organic carbon, the soil gains a water storage capacity of on average 20,000 gallons of capacity per acre, which is enormous. So to conceptualize these two statistics, because they're just kind of abstract numbers, unless we give a real world example picture. This is a, you know, about five foot three woman in a 600 gallon tank. So that's every square or every thousand square feet of roof or pavement. That's how much water is running off. And then, you know, so we think about these subdivisions, all that adds up. Um, and I'll get to the 2000 uh, gallon statistic in just a moment. First, I want to talk about uh, some diagrams that a professional hydrologist, Raymond Slade, said, uh, gave me permission to use in this talk as I spread the word about this. So in a natural basin, when we have that water sinking into the ground, if there's a rain event, you know, we get a little bit of a peak. This is the amount of water in the creek at a time. It, it rises up and then it comes down. But when we have a lot of impervious cover, we get this really high spike. This is called a hydrograph. We get this really high peak and then it comes back down. So uh, COVID actually gives an opportunity to conceptualize this. Uh, we want to flatten that curve. You know, this is a, that COVID spike that we're trying to avoid so that we don't overwhelm the capacity of the hospitals. We don't want to overwhelm the capacity of our ditches, our creeks, our rivers at all either. 
uh, in an urban hydrograph, we have this really high spike, and we just want to flatten that curve and get it back to the hydrology of a natural basin. Um, when we have that peak, that's when catastrophes happen. That's when millions of dollars of damage are done and people are killed. Uh, we want to avoid those kind of situations. And avoiding that has a lot to do with how we manage our land and how we manage the urban development patterns. You can see these huge down cuts along these creeks where massive amount of erosion has happened. Uh, that's entirely to do with massive amounts of water ripping through that area all at once. This, is, this happened at the peak of that hydrograph. And these are not the type of situations that we want to have if we own a house like this one. We don't want that down cutting. Or if we have a road right there, any sort of infrastructure, we don't want that. Uh, and even if we don't necessarily live on it, it's not good for the aquatic life that's in the river or the river itself for that to happen. That's when we get muddy water rather than clear flowing water. So the old paradigm that people were operating under was let's get this water out of here as quickly as we possibly can. Put it in the storm drain, get it away from these houses, send it through the river or creek and get it out of here. Well, that worked for a little bit, sort of, uh, but what we're learning is that there's a whole lot of unintended consequences there. Uh, flooding downstream, poor and poorer water quality, trash in the rivers. So here's the moment where, you know, I want to look at the area right by my home. I live in San Marcos, Texas. We have a gorgeous river here, but we also have a city. And luckily the city tries to spread awareness of this. It says, hey, what goes here in our cityscape ends up flowing to our beautiful, clean, clear river. So this is the storm drain outlet where a lot of the city's stormwater comes in to the river and flows out down here. And then you know, into the storm drain, out through there, down into this, and out here into this gorgeous river, all through the storm drain. A lot of people have a misconception that the storm drains are filtered, but they're not. Um, luckily, the San Marcos River hasn't had so much development around it to cause a bunch of damage yet. But uh, if we look at the San Antonio River, which was a twin river to the San Marcos River. They were once both the same level of cleanness and clarity. Um, we can see what a significant impact our uh, human infrastructure can have. So here's a tale of two rivers, the San Marcos River, beautiful. You can see the bottom, you can swim in it, kayak in it. It's a great place to recreate, you know, put your goggles on, swim through the wild rice, see a bunch of fish, you can see what's going on around you in the river because it's clean and it's clear. And then we have the San Antonio River, which you are advised not to swim in based on the levels of E. coli. And uh, that's related to the amount of stormwater runoff that goes into that river. And stormwater runoff is the number one source of pollution in our rivers. Here we are in the Mission Reach uh, kayaking for the NIPSA uh, conference a few years ago. Uh, you know, it's great that they transform this from drainage ditch back into river, but the water quality has still, you know, because upstream water quality issues in terms of the cityscape haven't been addressed, this water is still murky. It's not clean and clear. It's not swimmable. Uh, you know, here's an example of the San Antonio River as a ditch. We have a willow tree here doing tremendous amount of service filtering trash, but I want to remind everyone that trash is just the most visible form of stormwater pollution. There's also sediments, um, hydrocarbons, uh, heavy metals from our brake pads and uh, you know other features of our cars as we drive them along that end up on the roadway and wash down into our rivers when it rains. And uh, also thermal pollution, which is uh, not something that many people think about, but our rivers are usually, uh, when they're spring fed, are fairly cold and our, our wildlife is adapted for that. Um, and when it gets a huge flush of hot water from uh, rain that's hit concrete and then warmed up, that can also be 
an uh, incredibly damaging environmental event. So what this is all about is thinking about our watershed. Uh, you know, there's farms, ranching, agriculture, there's certain uh, sources of pollution from that, sediment uh, being a major one, herbicides, fertilizer, pesticides, construction, always huge amounts of sediment, debris, trash from that. There's the city, uh, parking lots, rooftops, oil, grease, all sorts of litter, chemicals, toxins. And then we have our neighborhoods, uh, you know, lawn chemicals, pet waste, oil, grease, uh, you know, soap from washing the car, um, sometimes sewage and litter as well. So all of these things contribute to the watershed. And regardless of whether you're on a farm or a ranch or in a you know, neighborhood style home, everyone's in that watershed. Everyone's contributing to the health of the San Antonio River, the Pernales River, um, the San Marcos River, the Colorado River, it all adds up. And with our situation, the Edwards Aquifer, that's also contributing to this underwater feature as, or underground feature as well, the Edwards Aquifer, our groundwater supply also is connected to our surface water and to our rivers. So I like to say, let's focus on the things that we can control. We not, might not be in control of what's happening in the city and industrial sector or the construction sector, unless we're having a home built, then hopefully we can stay on top of our contractors. But if we're in a neighborhood or if we're on a farm and ranch, those sorts of things are in our control. We can try and manage the water that hits our land in a way that's healthy rather than a way that's damaging to the river and groundwater supply. It's just again thinking about what level of impact we're having because if we have a roof there's water that's directed off of it. If we have a driveway there's water that runs off of that. So mitigating that is very easily and cost effectively possible by putting together one of these rain gardens and sinking that water into the soil. And not everyone has to go out and you know canoe around and pull out a bunch of cans from the river. This is one day's worth of cans on the San Marcos River with my buddy Zach Halfin. Um, but we can all be part of the solution. And sometimes that solution is just setting up infrastructure on your property to do this work passively. You don't even have to go do anything. You just have to set up an appropriate system to catch that water and sink it into the ground and catch whatever runoff there is, or whatever pollution is in that runoff and put it in a calming space so that it can catch in a basin rather than just running off and going straight to the river. So going back to that 1% increase in soil or organic carbon, that's the amount of carbon in the soil, we can gain 20,000 gallons of water storage per acre with a 1% increase. So that's what 20,000 gallons looks like. It's huge, that's a massive amount of water. And if you're looking to buy a tank this size, uh, you're probably looking at a you know $20,000 expense. But if you can store it in the soil, you can probably do it for a significantly cheaper amount. So long as you're not trying to use it for your drinking water supply, if you're just trying to use that for your crops and your native plants and to nurture the life around you, sinking it in the soil is way easier and way more cost effective. But then we have to get into how do we increase soil organic carbon? And we'll get to that in a little bit. So we got to sink that water into the ground where it belongs, put that carbon back in the ground where it belongs. And these two are intricately linked. So once again, we're looking at this solution that we have. It's small scale and it's collective, and we're going to deal with stormwater pollution that way. Looking at whole watersheds, but also breaking down what our individual piece of that is. We've had this problem, this old paradigm of, well, we got to get this water away and we're going to pave the land here so we can drive. We're going to pipe that water away from us, and that leads to pollution. But the solution to that is fairly simple. And when I used to do these meetings in person, I would have people say this with me. So say this in your home to yourself, because if you don't get anything else from my talk, this is the one thing I want you to remember. The solution to stormwater pollution is to slow the water down, spread the water out, sink the water in. So say it again, slow the water down, spread the water out, sink the water in. 
and that's key. So, you know, old way of doing things, let that water run off into the street. That's going to go into a pipe and it's going to flash flood in the river and bring all the pollution with it. But we can do it better than that. We're smarter now. We've learned some things. We can harvest that water in a cistern. We can harvest it in landscape features. And we keep as much water as possible out of the storm drain and let that water get to the creek and river very, very slowly moving through the ground, moving through the soil, rather than letting it flash flood off. And this is the foundation behind the concept called low impact development or green stormwater infrastructure. There's hard engineering, which involves pavement. This is sometimes called gray stormwater infrastructure. And then there's what's called soft engineering, which is biological and involves using plants and soil to take care of our water supply. And it works incredibly well. There have been mind blowing results from this. All of the water is inter interconnected, especially in this region. Our surface water and groundwater are really, really tightly connected. And a lot of people throughout the United States are saying the exact same thing. We're gonna get all of this water and we want it to recharge our groundwater supply. Slow the water down, spread the water out, sink the water in. We want it to percolate, we want it to infiltrate. We want it to go into the soil that will retain that water and it'll flow underground and keep our creeks and rivers cool, clear, and flowing. We can do that in multiple ways. We can do it with rain gardens. We can do it with bioswales. We can do it with rainwater tanks on our roofs. There's a number of techniques here. So here's a cross section of what a rain garden looks like. We've got the swale or basin here. That's where the water catches. We've got the berm, which is made from the soil that's pulled out of the basin. We plant stuff on the berm. Trees do really well here, incredibly well. Uh, and we also plant, tree, uh, plant other types of plants that can handle inundation in the basins. So here's another agricultural example from a friend of mine. This is out at Boxcar Farm. And um, another local farm that's done this is called Thigh High Gardens. And about Gosh, I used to say it was five years ago. It's probably seven or eight now. Uh, they planted some fruit trees on flat ground. And those fruit trees are still about, you know, they're slightly larger than they were when they were planted. But about two years after that first planting, they made some berms and swales, some terraces like this to catch that rainwater. And the peach trees that are on that are, you know, five, six inch caliper, they're huge. They're really huge now. And their mulberry trees are 20 feet tall. And they planted pretty much the same species composition on flat ground and on berms. The berm plants that are with this rainwater harvesting system did so much better than the ones that are planted on flat ground. Plants really love it when we harvest the rain. They do incredibly well. And one thing that you'll notice in this picture is there's nothing planted in the basins. But if we do plant things in the basins, which is something I've been doing and advocating for, is we create what are called root channels. Like this man here, you can see these incredible root systems next to him that reach deep into the ground. Those increase the infiltration rate even more. We also have habitat provided for wildlife with this basin vegetation. All these roots underground, they're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, sinking into the ground. Uh, we've got to be careful with which plants we select for this, because if you stick a lantana in a basin, I swear it will drown every single time. It's not going to work. You have to know what plants like that, like our eastern gamma grass, our bushy bluestem, they love those conditions. Um, and we get this opportunity when we do this to create resilient beauty with native plants. Like that real life picture, we also have this famous, famous diagram showing, okay, here's our turf grass. Over here, itty bitty, uh, you know, some people have said you can get a foot of root depth with Bermuda grass. On average, it's more like six inches or less. Well, that's not sinking the water very deep into the ground. You know, water follows the path of least resistance. If it's only got a pathway for six inches into the ground, it's not going very far. But if we have some of our native grasses that are part of the natural prairie system that was here, look, we can get, you know, eight, 12, 15 feet of roots 
guiding that water down deep into the soil profile, giving us that deep infiltration. And that's part of what doing it right looks like. So I'm gonna start moving into some concrete examples of that. Here we have a fairly lifeless lawn, again, probably about six inches of root depth. And we can transform that lifeless space that has a lot of runoff from it back into a native plant scape that is bursting with life. There are hummingbirds fighting over this territory and uh, it's sinking water deep into the soil profile. And each of these homes is just a drop in the bucket, but when we do them together, they start to add up. So I'm gonna move into a quick case study of a homestead we did for the Double Z Ranch near the Medina River. And right after our first installation, which we finished in May of last year, uh, this is what it looked like. And this is drone footage. And six months later, when we came back to plant the trees, this is what it ended up looking like. We did have to remove some hackberries that were uh, too close to the roof over here, but we did leave the stumps uh, a couple feet up off the ground so that they could provide a, a little bit of shade and be nurse trees for the new fruit trees they have in their backyard orchard. So we started out with this. We dug the basins, which looked like this. Then we filled them with rocks to give them that very beautiful accented pop. And then we let the plants do their magic and grow in. So we've got in the earthworks alone, 16,000 gallons approximately of rainwater catchment. Uh, they've got a number of organic food plants growing there. Um, we restored the prairie ecosystem, which less than 1% of that ecosystem remains. This is an incredible habitat for wildlife. They're getting to see painted buntings in their yard. Uh, we increase the soil organic matter, which is how we gain that massive 20,000 gallon per acre increase in storage capacity, just with the soil. Uh, it creates a delightful outdoor space year round, seasonal interest with the grasses in fall and winter, and then wildflowers in the spring. Uh, it's resilient to both drought and flooding, and it also provides groundwater recharge for the local well and the Medina River Springs. That's the backyard when we started. There it is with our excavation in progress. Look at that really rough soil, not a lot of organic matter there, probably down less than 1%, pretty chalky. We amended that with a lot of compost, a lot of mulch, put a lot of native plants in there. And this is what it looks like in August. Boom, big shift. And there it is in November. You can see uh, fruit trees planted in the berms over here native grasses providing color. We started out this process by doing our standard watershed analysis and then designed with that in mind. Uh, it's a 250 acre property. We looked at the entire watershed to understand what was going on and zoomed in toward the house. This is the topography map, contour lines, each one foot interval. And uh, this breaks down the network of water flow. Like I said, those blue lines represent the low point. You can see Highway 16 is down here and the water is just flowing along Highway 16. Here's the creek that runs behind their property. And before this water goes out into the pasture, we wanna catch it and use it in their landscape. Again, we have this breakdown showing, okay, this yellow basin feeds to this blue line, this green, watershed area feeds to this blue line. We want to size our basins accordingly. Uh, I recognize we're at about 634, so we might not necessarily have time for this entire video because I want to move through to some other information as well. Um, but I'll, oops, oops, let's see. Where did we go? One second. Well, in an attempt to save time, it looks like I went back a significant ways. There we are. I'm just gonna skip ahead here to where it's around the house. So you can see here, we're catching and designing for those watershed basins, intercepting the water before 
he gets out into their driveway and then heads to the road. Every opportunity we have to catch that water, we're taking it. Sinking it into the ground, there's their permaculture orchard in the backyard, making use of that runoff water there, which we've rerouted. And this next bit goes into the creek, so we'll, we'll skip that for now. Uh, if you want to see more of these videos, we do have a YouTube channel that you can check us out on and see the full version. So this rainscape design, we start by importing our watershed analysis maps. And then we go out to the site and we look at what the existing conditions are. We take some careful on-site measurements. Um, and for this particular project, I really wish that we had tested the soil organic matter to establish that baseline. I'll get to why in a little bit. Um, we did take existing conditions photos, we take it into our design program, model the current conditions, then we plan for our earthworks layout. Say, how are we going to catch this? We make all of these different features to catch that water. And this table I put together for the EPA's Outstanding Green Stormwater Infrastructure Competition, breaking down, okay, how many square feet are each of these areas and how many gallons of rainwater catchment is involved in that. Um, <clears throat> we use the soil as a sponge and that's our largest green infrastructure feature. And that's something that I stressed pretty heavily in our presentation to the EPA because it's something that I see being overlooked in the professional core of this. A lot of people are lining these features with concrete or with plastic and that disconnects it from being able to sink into the soil and really take advantage of that. Every 1% increase in soil organic matter gains us 20,000 gallons on average of water storage capacity, and that's just per acre. So there's some assumptions on this. I don't want to take you all too deep into the weeds here. If you want to see more detail on this, I have the recording of my presentation for the Texas Riparian Association Conference that dives in depth into this on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can look into that later. But uh, essentially, I want to highlight that there are some soil health practices that we use to increase that soil organic matter. We use cover crops and reseeding natives mycorrhizal inoculation of the entire site. We use uh, native plant roots, which many of them that come from our own nursery have mycorrhizal hosts. They're, they're hosts to mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, to decrease the amount of water used to establish the plants, we use low volume drip irrigation. Uh, we plant timed with the seasons. We did not plant trees uh, in May when we first did the in initial installation we waited until the fall to do that. So we weren't pumping out a lot of water to keep those trees alive. Um, we also you know, planted a bunch of nectar and seed producing native plants uh, and that attracts beneficial insects and uh, attracts wildlife for the homeowners and doesn't require continuous watering to keep beautiful. After the first year, the irrigation system can be turned off on the, the zones that are for the native plants. Keep the water on for the fruit trees because they need it. But uh, we also, this is big, mulching and composting on the entire site. And then also in some areas like the basins using river rock to cover the soil and help retain that moisture and minimize the exposure of the soil to uh, the heat and dryness around us. So real quickly, again, not wanting to get too deep into the weeds. Um, if we manage to increase by just 1% throughout the project area, we're gaining almost five gallons of water per square foot uh, throughout this third of, an, or, yeah, third of an acre project site that comes out to uh, over 50,000 gallons of water storage capacity. And by the time we increase 4% throughout the project area, that gets us up to over 200,000 gallons of water stored just in this third of an acre. Um, actually, it's more like a quarter of an acre. So that's huge, uh, especially when you start thinking about it on the, well, if this happens on 10 acres or 100 acres or 1,000 acres, it really adds up very quickly. And like I said, I wish we had that baseline data for this site because 
without knowing what we started with, I can't know how many percentage points we increased. But in general, most of our yard spaces are less than 1%. Most of our agricultural spaces are less than 1% soil organic matter. And it is entirely possible in many cases to go up to 5%. Um, in less than five years. And that's a modest increase that gets us closer to the historical values. And the historical values would have been anywhere from 8% soil organic matter to 12% soil organic matter. So if you imagine our rangeland uh, prior to that soil organic matter drop off and say, okay, seven percentage point increase or decrease in storage capacity. Okay, that's 140 thousand gallons less water per acre. And that's the reason our springs are drying up. That's the reason that our rivers are running muddy is and our like we see this incredible dryness happening is we're not storing that water in our soil. We've got a broken water cycle. So when we looked at this site in August and tested the soil organic matter for the sake of our tree planting, we found that it was at 6.2% soil organic matter. And I really, really wish I knew what it was when we started because we might have achieved 5% in uh, under six months. So <clears throat> getting back to just the design phase, you know, just conceptualizing, hey, what can we do with this space that's a boring lawn and isn't really doing anything for anyone? Well, here's a rendering showing where all of the different basins are that we're planning to put in. And just a different view of it. And then after we plan where those basins are, we move into planning where each of the individual plants is going to go, how that all fits in. Here's the plant list. Like I said, upwards of 140 different native species uh, that didn't include fruit trees or vegetables. And here's a uh, side view rendering showing everything in full bloom. Obviously it never looks like this because not everything is in bloom at the same time, but you do have your Greg's mist flower blooming and then you have a uh, uh, Gallardia blooming. You've got Maximilian sunflowers. You've got native grasses providing that winter interest and that all contributes to a healthy habitat. And like I said, we provided food security here as well. We, added an area to allow them to grow peppers and tomatoes. And when we came back in the November, they were like, we've had too many tomatoes. Y'all eat as many tomatoes off the plants as you possibly can. And we couldn't even tackle all the tomatoes there where we got tired of them. It, it was abundant, uh, extremely, extremely abundant. So we plant it out and then we make it a, uh, you know, this is showing what that permaculture orchard looks like with cover crops to get that soil prepped and then fruit trees. So we put all that together and then we move into installation. And this is what it looks like in August. We have a feature here where their cistern system, which is 10,000 gallons overflows out of this green pop-up. It fills this basin and if the backyard is ever too full of water, we have this emergency drain to get the water back out into the pasture. It follows the original routing that they had their cistern going. And I said, well, isn't that a waste for your, if your cistern overflows, it just goes out into the pasture in a way. Let's, let's harvest that for your fruit tree orchard and that basin overflows into it. There's some of those beautiful tomatoes, uh, little sun gold cherry tomatoes. You can see the irrigation going in that really rough soil. In the front yard, we hand dug these because that uh, beautiful stone fence was in the way. We could do a lot more with this machine. Uh, it took about nine hours of machine work to do the same thing all around the house that we did in the front yard. Here it is continuing to dig out that side yard. And then from there, once we have those earthworks built, lots and lots of plants. That's one of my favorites, the Eastern Gamma grass. It has some of the best root systems for sinking water into the ground and reinstating those mycorrhizal fungi. We use a whole palette of plants. Uh, I like to say those are our paints. We sculpt the earth 
and then we paint with the plants, getting everybody watered in nicely. We use um, Native American seeds. Those are the blue bonnets for their lawn. Um, one of the things that's great about this is we're not just helping the land, we're also helping people. We installed this project right after COVID hit and uh, this worker, Max, uh, had just lost their job in the service industry completely dried up. Uh, they were real proud of this blister that they got working on the job site. And this is now my assistant manager. They've really done a great job being part of the landscaping team. And what this is about, it's not only restoring the environment, but we're also giving people clean green jobs that mean something, uh, not just you know doing service for people, but also doing service to the earth and to the water supply. So this is what we created. It's very fulfilling to create these, not only for us, but for our clients to you know walk outside and have this be their space rather than this lawn doing nothing. It's now this beautiful place with an incredible diversity of native species. This is Aristolochia tomentosa, one of the native Dutchman's pipe. It's pretty rare. There's the space grown in in August with all of the cover crops in that fruit tree orchard. And one of my favorite native plants, the fall obedient plant, which we plant in most of our basins. So it does such a great job and the pipevine swallowtails love it. So we didn't plant the trees in May. Trees don't like it when we, they get planted in May. And sometimes uh, planting in the hill country, that involves doing, using a skid steer. So we got that out and planted a bunch of trees all at once. Uh, it was over 46 different trees. We brought them out there inside the van so they all kept their leaves. Uh, those are the, uh, the fruit trees. And then we've got our native trees over here. This one I'm particularly excited about is the linden tree. You almost never see that in the trade, but they're uh, very rare and get absolutely massive. We also have a Canyon Senna, another rare native plant. Our clients love grapes and wine. So we planted grapes for the table and uh, wine grapes along their back um, retaining wall. We also planted figs. And you can see that the garden that we planted in May has gotten quite woolly and wild at this point. Uh, it is truly acting like a prairie. And I really wish I had a picture of this just a few days earlier because these back here are the Maximilian sunflowers and they're covered top to bottom with yellow blooms. So in terms of maintaining this space, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it looks like a wild prairie. Um, we've got a lot of native grasses. You can see the little blue stem right here. That's in August. And then we have November. The Indian grass is in full stride. The Maximilian sunflower is providing a bird feeder. We've got the glowing bushy blue stem and seat mulies here. This is back in August. We've got the partridge pea, Greg's mist flower, and gallardia going crazy, creating a really nice space. And there's that little blue stem with that beautiful rust orange color. And um, no, we trimmed back the side yard because it was a little bit getting close to their patio and they wanted it to get a little tame and then wild in the back and tidy it up toward the front. There's the uh, fragrant mist flower, which is great for the monarch says they're migrating. Um, I'm gonna skip through this video because it's 7.49 and I have a few other projects I wanna highlight. But if you wanna see that drone footage of this site, go ahead and hop over to our YouTube channel and we've got a, I think it's about a five minute video outlining what this looked like um, once it got established and doing flyover shots of the entire project. So I wanna highlight that, you know, you don't have to have a 250 acre ranch and a massive rooftop to be able to do something to make a difference on this. So when we make rain gardens, we're not doing something that's colonizing the land and changing it away from what it once was. We're taking it back to what it once was. We've lost some of our historic megafauna here that we're doing this work of helping the water get into the soil. We lost our prairie dogs, we lost our javelina, and we lost our bison. And each of those animals was excavating and making space for the water to go into the ground. So we named our rain garden packages after this historic megafauna. So one thing that people forget about bison, they're not like cattle. Um, and in fact, I wanna highlight this white bison was at a ranch near where we worked in Medina. Uh, if you 
take the highway, if you're on Highway 16 and make a right towards Center Point and then follow the road through there, there's a ranch there with these white bison. Uh, they have uh, about six of them. It was pretty incredible to see. There was a calf out there that was white and we were commuting out there to work. It's incredible. Um, anyway, the um, bison wallow. They're different from cattle. They act kind of like pig cattle and they create these basins looking, <laughs> which looks very similar to a, a messy rain garden. Um, it's called sometimes the prairie pothole, um, but it captured rainwater and created an ideal space for the native grass and flower seeds to germinate. So we're mimicking the bison. And the project that I just showcased for y'all at that branch by the Medina River, that's what would be considered a, a bison level package, uh, though it went quite a bit up and beyond the bison level. So we were calling it the white bison. Um, it was you know, a, a big project. Uh, we also have the javelina package, which is kind of a standard front yard size in a suburban neighborhood package. So uh, this is starting out in the front yard in uh, urban San Antonio uh, in the Woodlawn Lake watershed. Um, and we dug that out and this space here, that window is this window here and you can't see it behind the cedar elm, but this window is this window here and that cedar elm is just out of the frame here. But we've transformed that lawn into this basin that catches and holds water. And this is right after planting. So you can see the native grasses are kind of small. We've got some little itty bitty plants in here. Uh, that's one of the things that we do to accommodate people's budgets is we plant plants small uh, rather than paying the nursery, you know, eight to twelve dollars a plant, we pay, uh, you know, significant amount less, uh, like a quarter of that, and the plants grow in to be about the same size in six months. So that's the original space. Um, we were out here digging this one with the mini excavator. Uh, it's a great piece of machinery, makes things go lots and lots faster. But in this particular instance, uh, there had been some landscape fabric laid down throughout the entire yard was disintegrating as we pulled it out. So that's what this basket is, is every few minutes, I'd pause and have one of the guys come up and sort through and pull that landscape fabric out so we can put it in the trash where it belongs. Uh, we almost never use weed barrier or landscape fabric in these because it cuts the soil off from the air circulation and water infiltration, uh, which is extremely problematic. And one of the reasons why I say xeriscapes aren't necessarily green and uh, if a zero escape is you know, just rocks with a few sparse plants and plastic underneath it, that's not particularly helpful for the water actually. Yes, you're conserving water, but you're also not letting much get back into the ground. Uh, each of these orange flags represents one of those little plants because we don't want to crush them. Um, when we were putting the rocks down, we had them all covered with these plastic pots um, and when we put the mulch down, we do the same thing. We keep them covered so that they don't get crushed. And then we pull the pots off afterward and then pull the flags once we're done completely with the space. So this is what it looks like in progress, getting those trenches dug. Here's the full crew out getting it planted, spreading that huge mulch pile. And this is spreading the stone across the landscape. And that rounds out, you know, a full javelina package example. You can see the rainwater is caught. Well, this is hose water because we do a test fill to make sure it's functioning as designed, but that space fills up with water. This space over here fills up with water. And if they start to overflow, yes, it's going to go down the sidewalk, but we're catching way more water than we would have caught uh, on that flat lawn with landscape fabric underneath. So Havelina package is our mid-level. And then we have our prairie dog package. We try and keep these affordable so you know, your average suburban family can afford to put these together and replace their lawn with this. We start out you know, digging that space out. This one we had to do by hand because we couldn't fit a machine through the gate. So lots of shovel work to get it to this point where we lay out the plants get them all covered up with the pots and then finished product. Uh, it was a real hit with the kids. They were out there playing in it. They loved it. And when I first went out to consult with this mom, I was like, 
Do uh, you want some space for the kids to play? And she goes, no, no, they can play in the rain garden. I don't need any lawn. Let, let them play in the puddle. Um, let them enjoy seeing the native plants and the caterpillars and birds and all the life that comes with that. So we, we get to enjoy being around a lot of like-minded people um, when we do these projects. You can see the reflection of the sky and this water. It's really nice. We've got a rare native grass here called two flower melic. It's pretty neat. Um, but the idea here is not just about preserving our native plant desert diversity. It's about slowing the water down, spreading the water out, and sinking the water in so that it goes back into our water bank account. And there is plenty of cool, clean, clear, flowing, and not flooding water for generations to come. We want these kids to be able to swim in the river. And not just the San Marcos River, this project was in San Antonio. And I have this grandiose fantasy of if we do enough of these, we could turn back time and make the San Antonio River swimmable again. Make it so that people can wade in Woodlawn Lake like they used to. I talked to a 80 year old woman who lived in Woodlawn Lake her entire life and said they used to play in it and now you can't. And that's tragic. So we wanna get it so that our waterways are usable not just for you know, kayaking and being in boats, but also for swimming and cooling off, um, creating these healthy environments. And the process of doing that is a lot of small scale collective action, but we all benefit from it. And we benefit from it, not only in our own yards, but the downstream effects as more and more people get on board with this and we are seeing massive amounts of people get on board with this. I have over 50 clients signed up right now and I'm working through that list. Um, people are, they get this idea and it comes out really, really nicely and it's gotten traction. And I'm just, you know, so grateful to be on this ship and part of this movement of, of making this change happen so that we do have a good water supply for the future. It's not all doom and gloom. It's not over, it's not ruined yet. Like we can still do something and we can turn this around and we can really make our water nice. And we can make these healthy habitats and it's delightful. So uh, I recognize I've got about two minutes left to get through this last little section, but I also wanna say quickly that this isn't something that just individuals are doing. In some places it is on individuals because the city and the county and the state, they're not doing anything. In some places the city is doing something and we can maybe even put some pressure on our cities to do something more. I, I know San Antonio is getting on this and Austin is really leading the way with this particular program called the Rain Catcher Pilot Program in Austin. And what's happened here is the city hydrologists have run a model that says wow, hold on, if we get each of these suburban homes to catch 70 or 80% yeah, of the runoff water from their roof in a 1.3 inch storm, we can flatten the curve. Remember that hydrograph I showed you with the big blue peak when, it, when we have that urban hydrology and the nice smooth curve and the natural hydro hydrology? Well, that's what this program is about. It's about transforming this suburban neighborhood and it, the steep hydrograph that they have back to a natural basin. And they figured out that they can incentivize this and get homeowners on board with doing it. So the program is called Rain Catcher Pilot Program. They've got some great branding. It says, I am a rain catcher. And right behind this fence is Waller Creek. Waller Creek has a lot of flooding. Like it's, it's quite significantly bad and it runs through downtown Austin. Um, this is the Skyview neighborhood and they're trying to get 75% of homes to have some form of rainwater catchment, whether it's cisterns and rain tanks or whether it's rain gardens to make it so that that water isn't flash flooding into that creek. They've got the baseline data from a, a USGS station right downstream from here. And they're scientifically setting out to prove that their model is accurate and that this system can work. And then they plan to roll it out. 
uh, citywide someday. Uh, it was 20 years getting to this point where they were actually implementing the pilot program of this for uh, its 1,200 homes is the plan. Uh, we did the first round a few years ago, and we've got two more of these projects on the books right now. So this is what it looked like when we were getting started. Uh, in the front yard, we set this up. Uh, each of the plants has a flag on it. It's getting a little dark at this point. We worked late into the day on this one to get it wrapped up. Here's the other side of the front yard, the big mulch pile. So uh, with this project, it was one of the first rain catcher pilot program ones. We agreed to work with some student volunteers from Southern Methodist University. Uh, they brought a lot of enthusiasm and energy to the project and they really got what this was about, which was very cool to see that uh, generational shift. Um, there's a long process here of the city rebates and uh, luckily the nonprofit urban patchwork is managing that side of it to help these homeowners uh, get uh, payment for these projects to go in. So uh, there's a number of contractors working on this. The urban patchwork coordinates us and matches us with homeowners and then helps those homeowners get rebates from the city. Uh, this is what that dugout area looks like. It can kind of look just like a lawn, but this is right before we planted it. It's starting to grow back in. This is what it looks like at the initial dig. There's that full front yard view. We did cut down a ligustrum there in the front yard, which is uh, needed some continuous cutting to keep it gone. Uh, you can see how this basin is catching that water and sinking it into the soil, not letting it flood into the street and go down the storm drain to the Waller, uh, Waller Creek. This is what's called an altimeter. We use it to measure the height of the land and make sure that through these conveyance swales, uh, the water is gonna move smoothly and evenly, not get stuck. And also that we reach the appropriate depth of this basin to catch the amount of water we need to. We also use this rototiller to help bust up this soil, which was a bit clay and uh, was a little tough to work in. One process note, and you'll probably heard me say this if you saw my last presentation, uh, we made a bit of a mistake here in that we dug the rain garden basin before we removed this big china berry tree here. And uh, when the china berry came down, uh, left a bunch of these china berry seeds all through the rain garden. But uh, rather than uh, letting each of these sprout into a little china berry tree and creating a whole mess of the project site, we did take the time to go through. And a stitch in time saves nine. We picked up every single one of these china berries. Uh, it took about an hour and a half, uh, filled a five gallon bucket, but we got them out of there uh, and there haven't been problems with those invading that space. So. Huzzah. Um, here are some of the plants. This was in December, so some of them are looking a bit rough, but you can see the fall aster blooming. We've got the salvia cosinea uh, still blooming and the fragrant mist flower also blooming as well. So this installation was a huge success. Uh, we've got, we installed a cypress tree and a sycamore tree. Um, there's that cypress again, Waller Creek is just behind there. It's created a really nice sitting area and place to observe the wildlife that naturally wants to be near a creek. You can see the water from that conveyance soil flowing smoothly down into that basin. Uh, Urban Patchwork helped us generate this quick design, uh, which is just basically outlining how much water goes where and how to catch all of what's coming off of this roof and get it into these basins. Big trees make people happy. It's fun to get those in the ground. We used a lot of little flags to mark the plants. There's that fall aster looking really nice. And like I said, we often plant things really small to fit them into people's budgets, but they grow from there. This space is now uh, completely overflowing with native plants. And that's, that's our motto is to try and cover the earth, uh, recover the earth rather with native plants. Um, rather than you know having gaps in between each plant, we try and just let them spread out, let them uh, mimic a natural prairie that was here. Let's make a natural system rather than uh, a formal garden. And uh, this is one of the student volunteers, and I, uh, um, I, want, I don't want to say it was a mistake, but I did tell the students that I have this thing where I put bugs on my face. And so uh, 
she found this worm and was like, well, it's not necessarily a bug, but will you put it on your face? And it's like, yeah, I guess I will. <laughs> and uh, there it is, that, that worm on my face. And uh, the point here is, you know, doing that humble work of digging these holes and making space for the water to sink into the ground. That's something that worms naturally do, right? On a very small scale, they're making that path of least resistance for water to get into the ground. The prairie dogs used to do the same thing. We can't necessarily bring them back. The javelina do the same things. The bison also do that same thing of wallowing and making space for water to sink, to catch, slow down, sink in, and spread out. So we can do that too. We can mimic those animals. We can't necessarily bring them back to their historic range, but we can mimic what they did in the environment. We can create a similar structure. And uh, I wanna invite all of you to, you know, start making that change and figure out how you can catch more water on your land so that the creeks and rivers around Frankfurt can improve steadily over time, can, can turn back, you know, the, the degradation that's happened, the pollution that's happened, all of that sediment. I mean, we're not necessarily going to pull that out of the water, but we are going to stop more from coming in. And uh, with the boom that we have happening in Central Texas right now, I think it's more important than ever that we make these efforts to change both our development practices and our agricultural practices to invite rain into the soil rather than letting it run off and escape from us. We want to make friends with the rain. So uh, thank you all for listening. Let's catch the rain. <laughs>